Hey, my name is Lynn Nguyen, and I'm the acting senior librarian at the Chinatown branch with the Los Angeles Public Library. I am excited to be here today to welcome you all to today's LA May program, Rise, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org events. And for our LA Made programs, visit LA or oh, lapl.org slash lamade. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. We would like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. Just a reminder, for those attending today's virtual program, you'll have an opportunity to win a copy of RISE. So please email ecdept at lapl.org for an opportunity to win a free copy of this book. So today, we're going to have a conversation with Jeff Yang, Phil Yu, and Philip Wang, authors of the New York Times and LA Times best-selling book, RISE, a pop of history, of uh, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now. Rise is a love letter to uh, and for Asian Americans, a vivid scrapbook of voices, emotions, and memories from an era in which our culture was forged and transformed. And here are the three authors of Rise, Jeff Yang, Phil Yu, and Philip Wang. Jeff Yang here. <laughs> Hi. Mm -hmm. Jeff Yang here launched one of the first Asian American national mu magazines in the late 90s and now writes regularly for CNN, Quartz, Slate, and elsewhere. Bill Yu is the founder and editor of the popular culture blog Angry Asian Man, which has a which has had a devoted following since 2001. Wow. And Philip Wang is the co-founder of the production company Wong Fu Productions. Since the mid 2000s, his creative work has garnered over 3 million subscribers and half a billion views online. Wow. So now let's welcome to the LA Made stage, Jeff uh, and the two Phils, Phil and Philip. <laughs> Welcome, guys. How's it going? Wow. I feel like Ooh. we made it. I feel like uh, being at the LA Public Library, hey, you, you, this is where uh, you guys put the Linda Lindas on the map. So this is, yeah. I, think, I think we made it. Yes. We've been you, LA made. We're the, we're the full, 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 full Jeffs. <laughs> <laughs> You guys have maybe we'll, we'll maybe this video will make it on to the, uh, the Webby Awards and we'll be the next winners. <laughs> you guys have totally made it. So, guys, the Phil's in one Jeff. Tell us, how did you all meet? Were you friends first? Wow, uh, depends how you define friend. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like people ask us like like um, you know Jeff and I have a podcast together as well, and yeah. people often ask us like, oh, how'd you guys meet? And like a legit answer to that question, honestly, is like from being Asian. Uh, it's like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, like just being in um, similar Asian American spaces and stuff like that. So uh, we've all kind of known each other and been aware of each other's work for quite some time. And uh, Jeff and I, we've collaborated together, um, you know, from for several years now on our podcast mm -hmm. and other and other things as well from just, again, being Asian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we and then our, our, our separate meeting stories are all kind of just again because we're i mean we wouldn't have met if we were not asian american right yeah, like that was our thing so true. all yeah. i i had interactions with both jeff and phil before they even knew me um i actually when i was in high school i read the jackie chan autobiography and i had no idea that even after meeting jeff i didn't know that i didn't know that he was the the author of that <laughs> 
Because I would, I was led to believe that in an autobiography, it should be the person that is about writing the book. I didn't know that there's another author. This is called "I Am Jackie Chan," not "We Are Jackie Chan." But um, whatever. Yeah. Well, it was cool just to like you know already be exposed to, to just you know work, and then when I was in college and Wong Fu was just starting, like very very in its infancy, um, Phil's blog actually posted about like one of our videos, and I honestly at that time at that age I thought like we had made it like. At that time in the 2000s, uh, early 2000s, like that was like the the place to get featured, and he was like our our variety. <laughs> so I thought I, I I was like super super feeling like I I had already accomplished a lot. So that's how I first kind of interacted. I love that. I love that. I love that. If, if I can log roll a little bit here uh, and note that, uh, so you know. I have I have a now large adult son who at the time was this, this like little chicken nugget uh, about to jump onto network TV and I remember actually one of the first times I I met Philip was because uh, he and the other Wang Fu guys actually interviewed Hudson uh, for their their YouTube channel and the funny thing is and I remember this clearly uh, his eyes were like giant stars at meeting these guys like. He goes to Phillips like, when I grow up, I want to be like you. I want to be on YouTube. <laughs> and, and then I'm that. like, I'm like, you're on TV, man. I want to be like you. <laughs> you're like a network TV, and you want to be doing YouTube. Oh, it is what it is. Uh, I I too someday hope to grow up to be Philip Wong. So anyway. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is hilarious. Um, what can I ask? Like, what is the age difference for you, all of you guys? I know Jeff. I I was reading a bit of your biography. You were born in 1968. <laughs> what about you, Phil and uh, Philip? Uh, we're basically separated by, uh, like, generationally. Like, I'm I'm 10 years younger than uh, than Jeff. And then uh, welcome back, then, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff is clearly the oldest. Because I'm old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. Technology. I was trying to answer a question. I realized, oh, that was actually the login button, which was not the one I should have pressed. Anyway, sorry. Um, um, I'm 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 37. Yeah. Okay. And cool. uh, I was born in 1968, which actually is meaningful <laughs> for the book, for what it's worth. But yeah. It's it's super meaningful. Um. Well, how did this idea, this book, come to fruition? Like, how long ago, um, you know, did this idea start, and and how long did the project take? For you to complete this book, Rise. Well, you know the funny thing is, this, the journey to this book began actually right in the wake of, uh, it, you know, late 2018, in the wake of this, just, you know, efflorescence of super cool Asian stuff happening. Right? There was this little movie called Crazy Rich Asians, which people were all like, "Oh wow, Asians actually exist." you know and they're crazy and they're rich and and uh, and there were like all these other shows this whole asian august thing happening there were gold opens people were you know lifting each other up on their on one of their shoulders and saying we're here get used to us and and the thing is um you know we were noticing that even in the midst of all this uh, kind of ecstatic celebration of just being us we were, there were all these media reports that were basically talking about our arrival you know uh, where did all these asians come from uh with these tones that sort of suggested like okay 25 years ago or whatever there was joy luck club and then now there's crazy asians and there was nothing in between right like we'd spent 25 years just sitting on our butts th sucking our thumbs and and that felt like weird to us because we knew that stuff had been going on and we knew that it wasn't just hollywood all of a sudden discovered and, you know, us again and, and hollered at us. We worked for that. We sweated for that. And we wanted to make sure that we could celebrate that. And, and that was conversations that both Phil and I and Philip were having independently with one another. I don't know if you guys remember, yeah, seeing those articles and those headlines, you know, first movie in 25 years, right? And yeah, just it, we knew just from our networks and from what even what we were doing ourselves, right? We knew that we were very active and it wasn't just 25 years of nothing and but the problem is is that the mainstream uh didn't know about a lot of that stuff and that's why it you know took a movie like crazy rich asians to kind of move that needle um to to kind of get that attention from the mainstream but that's the point of the book is that we wanted to capture and memorialize them and, and uh you know preserve all the stuff that mainstream missed but that still deserved to have their story um remembered and uh and yeah just you know 
it, it, it deserved a, a shine, right? And if, if there was never going to be a, whatever, a big headline about it, like we know that it was impactful to us um, or these people, these movements, these subcultures. And so that's why we wanted to make the book. Yeah, the thing about, um, the thing is like when you're living in history, you don't realize it's history while you're living it, you know? And a lot of these things that we went through and a lot of things that we observe in the book, it's stuff like I don't think anybody while they're living it in a million years would have ever thought it would be captured in a, in and 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 sort of cataloged and and canonized in a book. Um, but we felt like it was look if nobody does this, it's not going to happen, right? Like we we a lot of our conversations ended with ah somebody should write a book about that. Like somebody, <laughs> oh it'd be great to have a documentary about that. Like let you know that slice of Asian America that we you know that is probably will be forgotten, you know, and then you say that enough times, somebody should do that. Somebody, you know, you eventually came to the conclusion, like, maybe we should write this. Maybe we should write a book. Um, I want to um, highlight something that we dug up to this morning, actually. It's a tweet that <laughs> Jeff wrote on September 29th, 2019. This is before we like had any proposal or um, anything like that. Uh, he said, there's a book I want to write. A contemporary history of post-1990 Asian America, interweaving first-person memories, interviews with key figures, and reporting from 30 years covering Asian America and the intersects of Asia and the U.S. Hit me up if you're an agent or editor <laughs> and are interested. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he just put that out there into the ether. Um, and then like, he follows it up with, par parent parenthetically, if anyone can recommend a good nonfiction lit agent, I'd be incredibly grateful. Um, wow. That tweet actually ended up hooking us up with our agent yes and eventually getting the ball rolling to what we're talking about today so awesome. uh, it started with a tweet i, I want to give add, your yeah oh sorry <laughs> I, was gonna, uh, I was gonna say can we give your agent a shout out let's do that uh, so our agent's name is rachel vogel and my my own agent had literally just retired uh and so i needed a new agent anyway and i figured like hey if we're gonna do this project this, this is a good one to cut one's teeth on as an agent, but we need yeah. to find somebody who believed in it, right? Yeah. Uh, and we also need to see if the world believed in this. And actually taking the example of, of this guy up here, right? If you can see Mr. Shang-Chi himself, I was like, I, apparently all the cool kids are just putting things out into the world via Twitter and then they're happening. Like, oh, I wanna be in the Marvel universe. Boom, there you are. <laughs> This this was our little, you know, our, our little literary moment of that in some ways. <laughs> it's funny because you can see Rachel's reply to your tweet and she's like, <laughs> you know, hand raise emoji. Let's chat. <laughs> it, you actually did. It worked. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, well, you know, you're all content creators, like dating back to Angry Asian Man and you know, Jeff, with you, you were a journalist way back in your college years. And then, Philip, you create all this, you know, uh, uh, YouTube and videos and all these interviews. Um, how did you, how did you guys get started in the content creating industry? Why? What like what was your purpose then? Uh, I'll start up with Jeff because <laughs> you're from 1968. <laughs> Well, yeah. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, I did not. I did not start creating content in 1968 at birth. But uh, <laughs> you know, 20 odd years later, I, I did actually. Uh, I launched an Asian American magazine at college, and then brought into the rest of the world uh, a magazine inside Asian America. Back in the days when magazines were a thing, was one of the first and the most widely read Asian American magazines. And I, I often talk about how technology and the journey of technology in some ways is a, a direct uh, tracking of the, the emergence of Asian Americans, right? And it makes sense because we were looking for ways to end run a system that had no use for us, that wasn't including us. The things that were most available to us were digital tools that allowed us to express for ourselves without the need for the resources and the, the handholding and the gatekeeping uh, that was preventing us from being parts of things like Hollywood. For me, it was desktop publishing and, and the personal computer. Like literally when I graduated from school, you know, I had like a Mac SE or something. And that was what we began publishing this magazine on. Uh, and without it, there's no way we could have actually as a small group of Asian American 20 something volunteers have put out a magazine that reached 200, 300,000 people per year. But that was nothing, right? Because by the time Phil came along, 
you know, he's like sitting in his kitchen, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, launching a blog. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to tell your story, Phil. Yeah. Well, the other, the thing about it is like, when you ask like, well, how did you start creating this stuff? Like, I, I didn't know I was creating something when I started, started. That's the thing, right? Like there was no like master plan to do this, you know? So when I started, it was really just trying to find a place to, to you know, get my voice out there and just a, a place to write down things that I was thinking about. Social media did not yet exist as we know, it. you know, Facebook and Twitter had not launched it in 2001 when I started the blog. Um, had those things existed, I probably would have just channeled that energy into like Twitter or Facebook, like just, you know, cause what I was doing in the first couple of entries of Angry Asian Man was just like sharing like pithy thoughts, you know, like observations, jokes, and, uh, and links, you know what I mean? That's what we do, you know? So, but those platforms didn't exist. So I had to make that, you know, and I, I did have a couple of, uh, sort of rudimentary HTML skills. And I put those to use, launched a, a website and um, just kept writing, you know, and the short version is like how we ended up here 20 years later. It's like, I just kept writing people list, people were reading it and the re the readership grew and uh, notoriety also grew. So um, the, the, the key part of that was that like, I didn't know that what I was doing would result where I am today but I'm kind of, I mean, I'm glad I put in that effort in the, in the beginning, you know? Yeah. Similar to Phil. Um, I, I also, there was no moment of decision. Like today I'm starting Wong Fu productions. Like it was <laughs> just very natural. And because uh, another platform that didn't exist when we started in 2003, when our first video went up, there was no YouTube yet either. Mm -hmm. And so I was just creating, making fun videos um, with my friends. And th that, that interest might've just started as a, as a, you know, teenager having a, home camcorder, I, I would turn English projects from written projects to video projects, you know, if I could. <clears throat> um, but yeah, we were just making just stuff for fun. And we just wanted to share it with our friends. And so um, thanks to, uh, you know, the technology that kind of converged with the time that I was, you know, coming or, or starting out, we had high speed internet on, on you know, on college campuses solely. And so we, we started garnering a, a large college fan base. I was passing all of our stuff around on AOL Instant Messenger. Um, <laughs> that's when we were that's when we were hosting our videos on our own website, similar to um, what Phil's saying, like we, you know, rudimentary HTML, a GeoCities, you know, account, and we had links in this, and we had to buy server space. It's it's kind of crazy to think that there was a time when you had to do that, right? Um, and so, yeah, just just to fast forward, you know, just we just kept going. Um, when YouTube came around, we actually saw more of a tool. We're like, wow, free, free video hosting, that's great. And then once we were on there. The, the fan base started growing because people were looking for faces that looked like theirs and mm -hmm. um and just the, the the society and culture was shifting more towards this digital um social media uh, driven kind of a uh, way to interact and also build businesses and that's kind of what we were very early on um kind of part of Great. thank you thank you for sharing that and and i have to agree um you know growing up i i'm definitely in my mid-30s uh, there was there were not a lot of AAPI uh, folks or celebrities that you would see on TV, people that look like us. So it's uh, really nice to, you know, see it today and to see it in this book, because I have to tell you, I wish I had this book when I was a kid. You know, you kind of feel so lost, like, oh, like, I don't, you know, people make fun of you because you're Asian. And then you start to feel like so small, like, oh, maybe I I wish I, I wasn't Asian because, you know, you deal with a lot of racism and hate. And still to this day, we're dealing with it. Um, I, I just want to mention this book um, has a lot of great information, history uh, about, you know, Asian, Amer Asian Americans. And uh, there's just so much content here. How did you decide what goes in this book and how did you decide who to highlight? And I, I, I also would like to mention, I know that you worked with a lot of contributors. Um, so yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, first of all, I wanna say that uh, we have been collecting photos of people who have put like bookmarks and tabs throughout Rise as <laughs> just for, it's like, <laughs> It's something that we really glory in. Yeah, when people go and like they put bookmarks throughout the book, we just know that that means somebody has read that book. Um, so thank you, Lynn. Uh, I mean, we we knew first of all that we need to have a lot of contributors because 
obviously the three of us do not represent a cross section of the diversity of Asian America. Uh, and, and so we, we needed to include people whose voices were authentic to all the different things that we knew we wanted to, to talk about. Uh, but we started out literally just by opening up a, a you know, like a, a spreadsheet and, and throwing in things that from our growing up, we knew had to be there. Like we knew that they were relevant, uh, to the experience of being Asian American over these three decades. And the thing is, it wasn't always the same things, right? I mean, you know, not just the three of us, but as we brought in more contributors, they all came in with things they wanted to, you know, suggest or pitch or see in the book as well, which is why it's 500 pages now. But, uh, <laughs> but yes, it, it began with that spreadsheet and it began with us kind of going back and forth about the things that we individually and collectively thought were, were part of that larger experience of, of being Asian American from the 90s to the 2010s. Yeah, it's absolutely true. It was supposed to be 300 pages, <laughs> not not a joke. And it, it kept on expanding and kept on growing. And, you know, huge thanks to our editor who is who is like giving us the OK, like, yeah, let's do it. Like, you know, and, um, you know, you, you need to have people behind you who are like kind of getting it, you know, get why why we need to do this and why this book has to exist in the first place. And that is that was our editor, Jenny Shu. Yeah. Yeah, but in terms of like just like how we chose also what went in the book, um, it really was was not that um, you know complicated. <laughs> like we we started off with just like an empty Google Doc, um, and you know we we wrote a lot of this and we organized. Basically, this whole book was made uh, during the depths of the pandemic, and so we were just on Zoom together and we just had we we're all just on the same doc and we just started off by. Um, creating a spreadsheet of, Hey, just throwing things at the wall. What, what in our experiences in the nineties, in our in, uh, respective industries and, and, and businesses um, have we observed and what should definitely make it in this book. Um, and it was, it was, <clears throat> it was things that were obviously important to us, but also if we knew that um, there was a thing that maybe we didn't participate in, we still put it on there because we knew that it was important to some part of our community. Right. And if we couldn't, if we couldn't do the research or if we couldn't speak on it, then we would go find those contributors or find people that um, could, right? And we were very mindful of, as we like looked at this list and we were kind of assigning who can do which parts and who can cover um, which which pieces, we also tried to make sure, um, just you know, piggy, piggybacking off what Jeff said, we, we want to be very mindful of, of uh, how inclusive we were. You know, we didn't want it to be too skewed towards like you know the experience of of phil's you know like <laughs> we, we phil americans phil americans yeah, yeah. phil americans we had to have more than phil americans right and so we literally yeah, not, not to be confused with filipino americans oh yeah oh my gosh <laughs> no we definitely want those yeah. yeah right so you know we 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 definitely were going through an editing and saying okay well let's 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 make sure we have pushed this up and then we can we can maybe edit this out because it's represented somewhere else and it was kind of like a big puzzle i i want to call out uh an example of something that kind of came to us uh, through contributors and then ended up being just like an amazing piece in the book, right? Uh, and, and that's this, the piece that we have in here about South Asians and their absolute dominance of spelling bees, right? Mm. Uh, it, it has become, uh, it, it's almost become like a, a running trope that if you actually look and see who the winner of the, the Scripps National Spelling Bee is, it's going to, the first 10 people are all going to be like, you know, South Asian, Desi of some sort, right? And um, we, we actually were introduced to the person whose story we put in the book by uh, Sujata Day, right? Who's a friend of ours, mm -hmm. uh, YouTuber, actor, writer, director. And she had just done a movie called Definition Please, which featured uh, as a protagonist, a, a South Asian uh, woman played by herself mm -hmm. who kind of peaked early. <laughs> Because she she was like a spelling bee champion and then never really recaptured that glory. And we wanted to first like tell her story, but she's like, you know, actually I kind of sucked at spelling, but I do know somebody who was great at it and who can talk to you. And that was Hiba Ansari. So we we did this this thing, uh, you know, kind of talking about her experiences, uh, dispelled, right, uh, as a childhood uh, spelling bee champ. And then... Um, walking, you know, kind of through the larger reasons why mm -hmm. this is like the sport of, of, of Indian Americans, like Team Brown, you know? And it, it ended up being a fantastic story, but again, it's something which we might not have thought of ourselves if we hadn't had that plug in to a diverse network of, of people who, who live the stuff, you know? Yeah, no, I love that. The book really celebrates 
all almost every even cultures that I wouldn't ha have even thought of like Bengali like you you highlighted so many it's not just like south it's not just southeast asians it's like south asians from all over uh the world um and and the stories matter so um i was gonna ask uh you know were there any besides besides jeff since you just mentioned that how about for you um philip and phil like what were some of the pivotal moments in the book that you really enjoyed Oh, wow. I mean, so that was the fun part, right? That blank spreadsheet where we were looking at like, okay, what are the people and the ideas and the events that make up the last 30 years of Asian America? Like what, what are the important, what are like the pivotal moments? What are the stuff that mm -hmm. gave us joy? And what yeah. are the kinds of things that we get to nerd out about? Because we control this narrative now, you know? And one of them for me was um, I really wanted to talk to MC Jin, the rapper, Right. Mm. Um, and, you know, he had this incredible sort of uh, like just pivotal run on um, on Freestyle Friday on 106 Park on BET back in the early 2000s. Right. It cemented his status as like a Asian American MC to watch. Like, you know, no matter what happened, like if you when people talk about Asian American MCs, he would always have to be at least in the conversation because of that feat of the seven wins in a row. So I wanted to go through his seven battles because they're all like on youtube but i wanted him to watch it with us and give us commentary like you know uh, michael jordan does in the in the documentary the last dance about his you know championship run with the bulls we wanted to do that but with Jin and his freestyle friday run and so he did and he was great and his re you know recollection of it is so so clean and just really great and um and honestly like it seemed like He'd been waiting for someone to ask him about this stuff, right? Like he, like you know, he's like, yeah, gladly. Um, and it's again, it's that, mo it's that thing where you don't, know, you don't know you're living through history when you're living in it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think having the benefit of looking from afar, looking back at it, it gives you a certain level of of clarity, and it also like mm -hmm. gives you freedom to talk about certain things. And I, we found that time and time again throughout the book, where we're asking people to look back back at this moment that they might have not seen as this like incredible pivotal like milestone moment but looking back now like we see it as that and we see it worthy of putting in this book so give us the scoop like give us the you know and a lot of people they brought the tea it was awesome yeah for me um i think the the greatest experience there's so many pieces in this book that actually taught me a lot um i think even just being part of like this author group um we were not experts in any of this stuff by any means right and me also being the youngest i think that there were a lot of things that i did not fully understand of things that i grew up with in my teens um in the, in the 90s that i got a different perspective on so this was actually very educational for me and I, that's why i think this book even though it is meant for asians um, or not, you know, it's meant for our community to enjoy and to to capture. There's, there's still like a lot that we just don't know about our own our own selves, right? And so one thing actually that was really stood out to me was this piece that um, we did uh, where we sat down with scholars from the Pacific Islander community because when we started off this book, where we had to face kind of like the fact or the the reality that like, hey. We're so often grouped together, like you know, we have, we're sharing this month, for example, AAPI. We have this 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 acronym that kind of is always applied to every event and every you know one of these these kinds of um, projects. But is this book actually going to talk about the PI? Or are we are we because Asian Asian American is already so broad and diverse. How can we also make sure that we're going to include the PI community? And we when we talked to them, they essentially kind of gave us their blessing of like, hey, do do your Asian American thing. Like actually. PI Pacific Islanders don't even really um, identify that closely with with this whole acronym um, at all, um, and I learned that for the first time that I thought that we were that we were in some weird way connected, but in fact they see themselves very separately. It's actually more they're more they feel more connected to indigenous people than they, than they do like the Asian continent. Um, and that was fascinating to me, and I'm so glad that I learned that because now it's kind of giving me a different lens of just how I, I participate in this entire month in general. Yeah, I I, th I think that a big part of that, you know, is that sometimes by including you erase, right? And the the narrative of the book is really tied to something, you know, which we talk about even on the the uh, exterior leaf of the book, right? You know, that there was in 1965 this opening of immigration to Asians for the first time in 
uh, you know, hundreds of years, right? Ever since Chinese were excluded and then all of Asia was declared the Asiatic barred zone, right? The Hart Seller Act for the first time made it possible for Asians to start immigrating in significant numbers. And we are the kids, or some, in some cases the grandkids, of people who came over during that wave uh, or after that wave. But the thing is, that's not the story for Pacific Islanders in many cases, right? Native Hawaiians did not immigrate from anywhere. America immigrated over to where they were and just like took it, right? And then American Samoa, the Marshallese, Marshall Islands, you know, there are like tons of other spaces. And, and the stories that they actually are connected to is more like colonialism and, and military occupation uh, and, and not the story that we see reflected in a lot of the, uh, the context of the book, which is immigrant and post-immigrant stories. So if we were to try to impose that narrative, it would inevitably have not made sense and, and maybe even have been insensitive to the truth and the authenticity of the Pacific Islander experience. And so we, we ultimately decided that we, you know, we would respect and reflect Pacific Islanders where they came and intersected with the Asian American story. But we weren't going to try to say this is the AAPI story because it wasn't. Yeah. It's really the Asian American one. I mean, we had to have that conversation very early on before we could proceed, right? Like that was yeah. a very early, early decision that we made that before we could even title the book. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I read that section and that was definitely one of my favorite sections too um, because um, what you did was you brought on these scholars and it was like a live conversation that they were having with each other. Mm -hmm. So you know that it's not just you making things up and saying, oh, this is how, this is what I learned. No, you're hearing it directly from the scholars. Um, so I really appreciated that in your book. Oh, geez. Um, well, can I ask you guys, I, I, I can ask you guys, like, you know, where did you guys grow up? Um, were you, are you guys all here from LA, California, or I know with Jeff, you're from New York. Are you New York? I'm from I New actually... York. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm from New York. And, and the thing is, I'm here literally because of Career for career purposes, and it's not my career, right? It's like yeah. Hudson when he got cast in Fresh, Hudson Yang when he got cast in Fresh of the Boat dragged all of us over here. Um, so I, I would say that uh, it has taken six or seven years now for me to start feeling a little bit more like I belong here, you know, in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the Bay Area, uh, the East Bay specifically, in a city called Walnut Creek, um, which is uh, like 20 minutes east of like uh, of, of Oakland and Berkeley. I am also from the Bay Area. On the other side of the Bay, actually, I grew up in Cupertino, which is like hella Asian, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, I was going to say, well, since you said, since you just mentioned hella Asian, um, Jeff, for you, I just so you know, I actually bookmarked your page here um, because <laughs> I really enjoyed reading about your biography, uh, you know, just about your life and how you got started here. Um, in America, um, I know I keep poking fun at you being born in 1960, <laughs> but I'm just yeah. teasing you. Um, I, I, I was getting a bit teary-eyed uh, reading about you facing, you know, racism um, mm. when you were out trick-or-treating with your sister. Can, yeah. um, can you please yeah. share? Can you please share uh, share that uh, share that experience a little bit so our audience can kind of get a feel for from you directly sure i'll bear my trauma live <laughs> um, you know so like i uh, unlike unlike phil and philip uh who who grew up surrounded by asian americans I, I i grew up uh in staten island which is just absolutely the whitest most new jersey part of new york right and uh everybody around me you know and and my family was particularly like white ethnic like mostly italian americans and mm -hmm. Um, we never quite fit in. We went to school actually in Brooklyn because we'd moved there from, from Brooklyn. And um, well, the one thing my parents never wanted us to do on an annual basis was uh, go trick-or-treating. Because number one, they were like, we do not want to send our kids out to go beg for food. And number two, <laughs> we do not want to buy clothes that are going to be worn once a year. That is just ridiculous. So we never got to go trick-or-treating. And then finally, I convinced them to let us go out. And it was just very simple. You know, we walked outside. The only thing we could wear that was something close to a costume was our Chinese language school, like martial arts and ethnic dance outfits, right? So uh, as soon as we stepped outside, we just ran into a mob of, of kids with like toilet paper and eggs. 
And they, they, you know, mocked us basically down the block and egged us. And uh, the funny thing is my sister's outfit included a parasol. So she was able to fend off most of the egg. Whereas I just got, I got completely massacred and we came home and my parents were like, you're never going outside again. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was, they were actively sort of shouting, you know, uh, slurs, like lightweight slurs at us. And, and uh, I think that maybe more than anything else that I, I experienced during my years living there was the first time I really felt like I wasn't just different, but unwanted, you know? Not the last time, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. You know, with um, the, the rise in hate crimes happening against our community, our AAPI community, um, I, I know, Philip, you've been really strong against um, all the things that have been happening. You've been really vocal about that. Can you um, explain a little bit more on why? And also, if you guys have any advice to offer for anybody that may be feeling complacent, lost, like, please do share. Um, I mean, I, I think like we all three of us felt a responsibility to utilize our platforms to to the best of our abilities or comfort um, or mental health, to be honest, um, when it's just like nonstop, it's it's almost like you can't even get a break. You're, you're still you're still gathering your thoughts or, or, or grieving from the last, you know, um, I guess, incident and, and then something else happens. And you didn't even get catch a breath. Right. Um, so yeah, with Wong Fu, you know, we, we definitely tried to create content that would bring awareness, um, you know, to what was happening. Uh, and also we, we talked a lot about like the, you know, Black Lives Matter, like marches and, and movement, you know, of that summer of 2020 as well, like trying to show solidarity and allyship, but yeah, definitely like with, um, just the last couple of years, uh, personally speaking, it's, yeah, it's been very, I, w I actually, you know, you asked for advice. Like I, I, I need advice. Honestly, I think I, I feel like, you know, even though we're, you know, we, we, we have this, this book out and, and, and we, we have been observers and critiques of, of culture for so long. It's, we're also just human too. And, and sometimes I feel like the problems that we're facing seem too big. And, and I, I totally feel hopeless at times. Like I think anyone else um, seeing some of this news come through. Um, but I, what I like to, what I like to remind myself is, um almost like make your world smaller um i think like social media uh not and i'm not saying like just like ignore what's happening but i think social media can sometimes bring too much information or, or and also bring too many opinions from people that like you like that, you, that will never matter but like essentially just there's it's like you're like overwhelmed and sometimes the 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 most positive good that you can have are in is, is in your immediate circle your immediate community um, and how can you try to um, enact change in your city, in your workplace, in your church group, whatever, in your business, whatever, in your school? I think that's what I like to always remind people that, hey, you, you can when, when it feels like all is lost, go a little bit smaller, like start start doing little things first. Uh, I, I'll add that, you know, th this book, the book that we wrote is is. Obviously, we conceived of it in, in during COVID when the, the rise and these these attacks like starting to happen. But I mean, I would argue like these attacks and anti-Asian sentiment in America is not a new thing, right? Mm -hmm. I think our attention is suddenly, you know, we have a lot of people's attention with it. But if you read the book, you'll see that like this is actually part of the latest round of this kind of thing happening to our community. You know, it, it's occurred through history, you know, and uh the book itself is an attempt for us to we're asking the question like who gets to tell these stories right it's usually somebody else telling these stories and it's somebody else like deeming which ones are important to tell and this is our attempt to you know center ourselves in our own history really because i would argue that we find ourselves in this place right now because uh we don't have a sense of history that others don't have a sense of our history and therefore our humanity Right. And when you can take away someone's humanity, you can do anything to somebody. Right. And so that's we're we are seeing right now the result of a lack of history, a lack of whether that that translates from curriculum or you know, storytelling or even Hollywood storytelling. And, uh, you know, if you want to talk about ethnic studies, all these stuff are attempts to remedy that right now. But like it's because we've had a lack of all these things that have led to this place of just 
unable to to see our our humanity and a lack of empathy. You know, uh, so there's a, a, a spread in the book actually that specifically references what Phil is talking about, and it's this thing we put together called uh, the Propaganda Family Tree, where we really show how a lot of the stereotypes that we we see in popular culture have this deeper root in war propaganda, editorial cartoons, right? Anti-labor posters. There, there have been caricatures of Asian Americans since there were Asians in America. Uh, but the problem isn't just that there were these, these images that existed as acts of violence against us to a certain extent. It's that those images then filtered into comic books and into cartoons, you know? If you, if you look at those early Bugs Bunny cartoons, those early action comics featuring Superman, you know, kicking butt on the nips and so forth, right? You, you'll see that the imagery there is directly reflecting the same kind of propaganda that existed in, in the military context. And so you have this generations of kids who are like being brought up with these images as the way they see Asian Americans, as the way they see Asians, period. That projection on us is what Phil's talking about when they say, who gets to tell our story? Well, apparently it's people who existed in the 1890s and who hated Chinese people because those stories are the ones that keep on coming back, right? Mm -hmm. And they have a real impact on us. I mean, this actually in June, June 23rd, is the, you know, it's the 40th anniversary of the, the killing of Vincent Chin, who, if anybody does not know the story yet, he was murdered specifically, uh, not because of who he was, but kind of because he, who he wasn't. Uh, he, Chinese American man, you know, uh, celebrating his in, incipient wedding, uh, gets into a fight with these two out of work white auto workers who, beat him to death with a baseball bat because they accused him of being Japanese and therefore responsible for the influx of imports that was destroying their industry. Well, that's the kind of thing that this sort of imagery leads to and, and continues to reinforce and how people look at us. So telling our stories is actually a way of, of you know, creating a self-defense for us as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Agree. Thank you for that. Um, gosh. In this, uh, in your book, you um, dedicated, the, at the very beginning, it says you dedicate this book to the ones who come next. Can you clarify a little bit more on, on that? Yeah, I think um, when, when we wrote this book, it is, it's definitely coming from a place of a little bit of nostalgia, definitely servicing some of like our own generation and making sure that um, we get to have our stories preserved, but, but for what purpose, right? And I think yeah. when we think about, um, especially with all this, you know, not this r new rise in violence, but just like this new form of what, of how America is kind of waking up to Asian Americans in America and, and um, what, what our participation is in, in the cultural landscape. I think like people don't really like the, the, the way, the way Asian Americans are being viewed is, is, very quickly changing, right? And especially for our kids um, or those that are younger than us, um, they're they're coming up in a very different world than, than we came up in, right? And I think we just want to make sure that um, we can let them know, hey, it wasn't always like this. This is this is important for you guys to see how we got here. And not in some like very dense doom and gloom uh, Asian American history book, you know, like a textbook. We wanted to, to, to show like some of the positive and some of the light to like keep it ins inspirational, right? Keep it hopeful that hey, like look at look at the amazing th things that that have happened in order for us to get to this point, and hopefully um, they can read some of these things and be intrigued and want to do more research and they want to know more, and we'll get a new generation of of curious Asian kids that are going to tell their own stories or or actually put it upon themselves to tell some of these old stories and in, in films and books themselves. So it really is just like us kind of just setting a like this one pillar or checkpoint like, hey, this is our, like something for us to all like kind of look back on as a reference point. Right. And it's up to not even I don't want to say the next generation specifically, but just whoever want, like reads it and comes by to say, hey, I'm, I'm inspired by this. And I want to I want to run with something that I found in here. Love yeah. that. It's, I think it's really a, a sort of a 
for me, it's a, just an encouragement. It's like you got this. You got this next, right? Like, look at all all this that it took to get us to get us here. I hope that all this work that has been done will just make it easier for you. Like, what? I mean, like, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to make it easier for the people who are coming next. The the younger folks, you know, our kids. If you want to be specific, mm. um, we tell these stories. Jeff tells the story of getting <laughs> egged on Halloween. <laughs> So that it won't happen again. Like, you know, we don't want this to happen again, you know? And, um, and, but if it does, if it does, like, you can look to Uncle Jeff's story. <laughs> to Uncle Jeff. <laughs> this is how to get the egg out of your hair. Yeah. <laughs> but no, my, the, my, my, my daughter refers to Jeff as Uncle Jeff. So, yeah. uh, uh, so it's, you know, like, it is, um, it is a, a an encouragement, you know, you got this. But, I will say it's an encouragement, but also it's a reminder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because there is some some aspect of this where, uh, let's be honest, like it's very different now for kids coming up, you know, for the generation that's coming up. And they, they hopefully will not have uh, some of these experiences or mm -hmm. obstacles facing them. But at the very least, internally, they don't feel quite the same way. They don't know a world in which BTS was not the biggest band in the world where anime and manga was not the primary means by which people learn how to, to, to read or to not pay attention in class. They don't know a world in which Chinese food is awesome and delicious and in every mall and sushi is aspirational and Korean food is in everything. This is like something they grew up with, but it took a lot of time to get here and remembering again, how hard it, it was to get here is something which is good for them in that regard too. I mean, you know, it's something Hudson had to learn. He did not know how important Fresh Off the Boat was when he was doing it. He just thought there was craft services and he had lots of free food. <laughs> <laughs> it is good. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, um, so tell me, will there be a second Rise book in the next 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> are you gonna, or are there any other projects you guys are going to work on together or is there anything in the works that you can share to our audience so they can look forward to? I'll, I'll first answer the question about if there's going to be another book or a, a follow-up. I think I, I, we, we, we talk about this and a lot of people wonder it too. And I, I actually hope that the next book doesn't require 30 years to go by, right? Yeah. Like the, yeah. the rate at which, uh, you know, our community is creating now and progressing is it is definitely in a, in a much more positive um, velocity than, than the last 30 years or the last, you know, since, since the 80s and 90s. And that means that there's going to be more stuff to cover in a shorter period of time. Right. So I hope that we don't even have to have a book exactly like this because there's going to be too much to cover and all those yeah. things will have their own books. Right. And um that, so so that's what when 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 we think about like oh is it going to be a rise too it's like oh are we going to see you in thirty rise years again <laughs> yeah and is it going to be like you know two thousand pages then you know yeah so yeah um but we have thought about uh you know we have talked about making a a young readers version of this book um oh, aimed at yeah. you know middle schoolers or or elementary school uh just because we already know that a lot of parents are. are sharing this book with their kids teenagers and even younger where there was a there's a very young um child that came to our barnes and noble uh, event a couple of days ago and super well behaved and was was listening and very impressive but um yeah so we want to do that for for the younger generation the the uh, working title i mean it's gonna be a little bit different because it's going to be about history but not to teach history but more to teach about what to kind of love about yourself. Uh, so the working title right now is Shine, because then we'll have Rise and Shine. <laughs> and it'll be about, you know, finding the shine inside yourself. So, yeah. I love that. I love that so much. Uh, well, um, you know, how about on a lighter topic? Let's uh, play a little, let's have a little conversation uh, game. I made a little PowerPoint. I wanted to... <laughs> Just so we could have some fun. Uh, I'm going to have my, my homies uh, pull it up just so we could talk about it. I love this quote, by the way. It's an honor just to be Asian by Sandra O. Oh. All right, next slide. All right, guys, tell me, when you <laughs> grew up, <laughs> uh, guys, everybody that's at home right now, just tell me that when you were growing up, did your parents ever cover the remote controllers <laughs> with saran wrap and plastic? 
they covered everything. <laughs> it was like, literally, there's like a plastic uh, coating on the sofa. You know, there was a cozy on the table. Like everything had to have basically a condom on it or it was like not safe for human beings to interact with. I didn't have the 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 remote, but um, we just we literally kept all the plastic on new electronics like that film. Yeah, <laughs> we'll keep it on as long as possible. And to be honest, I still do that to this day. It drives me crazy. We, we were yellow and yeah, we were barbarians in my household. We just took off all the plastic, so we we we, we live dangerously. Bold. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Did you guys ever grow up with your parents <laughs> using the dishwasher as storage? <laughs> and it wow, the, up to today. <laughs> the 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 one with the 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 cabbage. The cabbage. Is really impressive. I've never seen that I've one. I've never seen that. That's either. hardcore, That's... man. I never thought of that. Yeah. Next level, man. No, <laughs> um, pretty hardcore. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I didn't start using the dishwasher until this past year. So I went through 36 years of life. Um, and I've only started using it because the baby came and I was like, okay, like oh, this. Yeah. And then, and then also, it. you know, what's really funny is that because my, my, our, our like moms have come over and stayed with us and they, they, they still aren't using dishwashers. And we were telling them that we were, and we completely demystified them and told them this actually saves water. And, and then, <laughs> and their minds were blown and now they're using it. It's kind of crazy. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> maybe the, maybe the appliances from like the seventies and eighties weren't actually as good. So maybe that's why. Yeah. They were, they yeah. Were because we always always wasting water. The old washing machines would always waste water. I mean, uh, dishwashers would do that. Uh, next slide. All right, ah, are course. you guys still keeping your shoes off? <laughs> Who are we? What are we, barbarians? Yeah, we're not, we're not barbarians. <laughs> we're not monsters. <laughs> Uh, why? I mean, I love taking off my shoes. And sometimes when I go to my non-Asian friend's house, they, I, I take off my shoes. But they always look at me they're like, what are you doing? It's the so, weirdest um, freaking thing. Wow. So, oh, my gosh. I, someone, someone recently, I think it was Natalie Tran. Uh, she's a, a, an Australian uh, YouTuber. She, she had this yeah. really interesting observation or question that she put out there that I never thought of. But basically, if, if non-Asians or specifically white people wear their shoes into the house, at what point into the night or going to bed do they take them off? <laughs> they sleep with them on. What do you mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like, really think about it. Like, you, never, you never see it in movies. It's like, okay, they wake no. up. And then do they put their shoes on right away as soon as they wake up? Or like, do they, at the end of the day, do they wear it all the way into the bathroom, like right before the shower? And then, and then, and then after the shower, do they put them back on and then go to the, go to the bed? It's, it's actually like, I'm, I've never, I've never thought about that. I'm like, yeah, like, at what point yeah. I don't, I don't know how it works. It's so funny sometimes. <laughs> You're I, I've heard, dirty. <laughs> I heard some people have inside shoes. Oh, oh inside, inside shoes make sense. Yeah, like inside slippers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, everybody, should, everybody has like house slippers. No, right? no, inside, like shoes. You know? Inside shoes. Like oh, inside wear, shoes. They'll take off their outside shoes and put on their inside shoes. And yeah, Mr. Oh. Rogers used to do that. Oh it's yeah, yeah. Mr. Rogers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my but gosh. Most people have like you know the Adidas slides. Which could be outdoor shoes too, I suppose. Uh, but yeah. you know, flip flops. <laughs> There's like a lot of ways to go. Oh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, when mom <laughs> says there's food at home. <laughs> did you guys take this? Did you guys take this from my mom's fridge? That's a picture of my mom's fridge. <laughs> did you guys go to Cupertino and take that photo? I, okay. That's the. By the way, that's the garage fridge. Yes. That's yes. not the. That's yes, not the, say that. that's that's the, garage. the garage fridge. Because, because you know we really what? got our first garage fridge this Every, season, look so. if you're asian and you didn't already have a garage fridge you got one the first few days of the pandemic of, of the quarantine even yeah. before the quarantine you're like it's coming we gotta we gotta actually put a cow in the the garage so we're gonna go <laughs> need to buy a garage fridge that's literally what we did and we we got ahead of the curve because otherwise no one had fridges after like month one of the pandemic which is boom that is true. And, and and everybody had to stock up on food too. And, and the grocery stores are running out of food, if anything. So you, you definitely had to like stock up the freezer. Oh, uh, let's go to the next slide. All right. Yeah. You guys <laughs> <laughs> the only Tiger medicine you need in your yeah. life, Tiger Bob and the Eagle brand. Uh, how, how did you guys use that in your life growing up? <laughs> Asian. <laughs> uh tiger bomb was on everything all the time uh i mean i i will say uh as much as it was like a, a soothing thing and even the smell in some ways like it reminded me of my grandparents and stuff like that yeah. so i was like oh yeah but um 
if you get that stuff in your eyes, you might as well just kill yourself right now. <laughs> I never used the I never used the green one, but I, I do remember the like the Tiger Bomb and my dad, I don't know if this is TMI, but he had a long, a long fingernail and he would use it to scoop and scoop <laughs> tiger bomb. <laughs> that was his tiger claw. <laughs> his talent, tiger talent, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, hoarder or survivor expert, did your parents ever hoard all the, the plastic bags? Plastic and the bags. Hotel, the hotel condiments. <laughs> and the soap. And the... I don't know. Is this, is this an Asian specific thing? Or like the other, like every, this... an immigrant thing. Does it. Immigrant I think everybody yeah. does it. But, yeah. but I do think, I think actually where Asians really uh, clean up, so to speak, is condiments. Yeah. For whatever reason, yeah. it's like I even in my generation, we have like basically two giant baskets full of various kinds of condiments. And every time we think, oh, we should probably get rid of some of these things. Like the very next day, we're like, ah, we needed some hot mustard. Where did it go? You know. <laughs> so yes, we, we will never throw away another condiment pack again. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Oh, do you guys have these, uh, you know, shrines in your house with like your grandparents, uh, or does your house smell like incense sticks? Or <laughs> my grandparents, not, not not mine. My, my <laughs> we never had we never had a shrine like this. Although we did like, uh, you know, annually pay respect to. We still do actually pay respect to our you know ancestors who have passed. Yeah. You know, so, mm. like like on the anniversary of my grandmother's death, we have like a what in Korean it's called a chesa, and mm. it's uh yeah. But we never we never had a incense shrine. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we'd also like Qingming. Uh, you know, we'd like go and and like pay respects at graves or or stuff yeah. like that. And I've been to wow the the real real deal like you know Taoist uh, slash Confucian funerals where everybody's like wearing you know, robes and, and ribbons and like wailing and falling on the ground and, and burning, you know, scale models of Teslas and stuff like that to send up as, mm -hmm. as that's, that's a thing. That's pretty yeah. wild. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Respect your elders. Uh, one of the things I remember as a kid, my parents would always make me bow to every single mm. person I would meet. And I, and it's, weird because i still do that now as an adult um what about you guys <laughs> or, do you, or do you teach your children do you teach your children to bow i, never like, on my I mean not, not the babies <laughs> I, I teach them to carry me everywhere i go <laughs> uh, for me it's inst like when i meet other uh older koreans it's instinctual to like to yeah. like uh, even at least a little bit like that you know and yeah. uh it's something i actually have not taught my kid and maybe i should actually uh <laughs> to make that instinctual as well i don't know next, i think it's just really polite, me, really. I expect about. <laughs> yeah. I'm old enough. I, I will say the only time my my kids bow and i think uh maybe it's because they saw it on tv not because we've even asked is the transactional bow on lunar yeah. new year right it's like mm -hmm. oh here's your red envelope but before you the red envelope you're going to do that bow right and they will do it and then they get you know, whatever the five bucks or <laughs> yeah, yeah, get that many. <laughs> I think that's get it. That, I, get that rice. <laughs> get that. <laughs> Is there any more? Any more slides? That's it. Uh, oh, Whoa. last one. Throw down for the bill. Okay. Oh, do, you, do you guys still are? Do you guys still fight off the for the? <laughs> do you guys fight for the like... bill, or do you see your parents fight? Throw down for the bill. <laughs> I feel like it's going to, I wonder if it's going to be lost in our generation or maybe my, my generation where um, it's like already pre under, like determined or understood who would like, who's going to do it or, but or, you know what it is also, I think we've gotten better at, um, I've gotten really good at the the sneaky, like mm. just, I'm going to go to the restroom oh, yeah. and then, and then mm. do it without them even knowing. So I feel like, I almost feel like they did this for the show, you know, because if they really wanted to pay them, you could sneak <laughs> off. <laughs> This is true. Well, I, I, I've actually prepaid at restaurants before, before even getting to the restaurant. You know, it's like open table yeah. will let you like be, okay, put down a credit card, you're paying, get there. Yeah. Oh, it's already taken care of, guys. Oh, that's smart. That's really yeah. smart. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the whole, the whole theater of this, like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Like that thing is like, I don't know. Like it's prescribed. We have to, we actually, we have to do it in a lot of ways. But then, yeah, yeah I think people are sort of like finding ways around it now in like, I don't know. Like, I, yeah, I don't know if it, this is going to survive the next generation because we're finding ways around it now to like next level. 
yeah. next level bill bill fighting i think i i will yeah. say this and it's funny you, you you just mentioned that the theater of it like perhaps like in the future it just becomes like hey I, we all know i'm gonna pay but let's just do this for fun <laughs> it just becomes That's what I'm saying, yeah or but I, was, I will say at bofa mofa i still see tons of people fighting for who's going to put the credit card because maybe on the smaller things it's a little bit mm -hmm. like less determined of like you know who's going to pay for like a coffee or, or lunch so right. i yeah. see that a lot still it still happens a lot people people argue <laughs> i love that uh well guys uh the, the time has come it, it just went by so quick and uh can can we uh can you tell our audience you know where your next event is or where they could find you well, if you're on Instagram, um, we're pretty, pretty consistent with posting like events there and updates there. It's just rise AA book um, is the Instagram handle. Um, but then everything else, yeah, if you just follow us on yeah. our social media, we'll, yeah. we'll be posting about okay. it. You can catch us in New Jersey next week and also Philadelphia. <laughs> if, <laughs> oh, in New York, if you happen to be Florida well, yeah. going out there. Yeah. Uh, and if you actually want to bring us out... Um, you can also email us at riseaabook at gmail.com. You know, that's a that's a decent way of reaching out to us. Um, but, you know, we're, we're around. You can look for us. Thank you for having great, us, though. It's been great. so great. Oh, it's thank been you so, so much, fun. Lynn. Yeah, thank you guys for being with us. Thank you for joining the LA Public Library. And for our audience out there, again, if you want to bring a Rise A book to come out to your school or your event, all you have to do is just email them at riseaabook at gmail.com. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for LA for the LA Made program with Rise. And remember to check out our library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out our next LA Made program, Yiddish Songs, on Thursday, May 26th at 4 p.m., where we welcome vocalist Harriet Benish. Uh, she will share historical pictures along with the English translations of the songs. So until next time, we truly appreciate all of your support. The success of LA Made and all of our programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you. I'll see you all next time. <laughs>